continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And this week, as last, I've invited two guests who have just collaborated on what has already become a quite controversial 10-part Showtime television series and an equally massive Gallery Books companion volume, both titled The Untold History of the United States. Peter Kuznick is a professor of American history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University in Washington, D.C. He has written extensively about science and politics, as well as Cold War culture. Multiple Academy Award winner Oliver Stone is probably the most controversial filmmaker reinterpreter of the American past since D.W. Griffith, whose classic birth of a nation even now, after nearly a century, still provokes anger and debate. Of course, full disclosure requires noting that I too have some skin in this game, namely my paperback, A Documentary History of the United States with Alexander Hefner, and my paperback edition of Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Now, last time I asked Oliver Stone about what he had told me over 20 years ago at this table when we had talked about his brilliant and equally controversial film, JFK. At that time, my guest had said, what's interesting about the movie, JFK, is that it's one of the fastest movies. It's like shh, splinters to the brain. We have 2,500 cuts in there, I would imagine. We had 2,000 camera setups. We're assaulting the sensors in a sort of new wave technique. We admire MTV's editing technique, and we make no bones about using it. We want to get to the subconscious and certainly seduce the viewer into a new perception of reality. So I ask both my guests if that's what they want to do now with their untold history of the United States. Seduce their viewers into a new perception of reality, maybe their readers too. And we went on from there as we shall now. And Oliver, you really rejected the notion of uh, seducing viewers now in this book and in this grand series of documentaries. Are you suggesting that maybe you were doing it with JFK, but not now? No, Richard, in both cases, I truly uh, believed that JFK was assassinated by more than one person and for, for a reason. There was a motive in his death. And the country changed radically after his death under Lyndon Johnson. I really believe that, and I still do, and all the research that I've done since then has convinced me, and we go into it in some depth in Chapter 6 of our series, uh, the JFK to the Brink. On this issue of the untold history, it has been the hardest job of my life. What do you mean? It's been five years of back-breaking labor to justify, to bring out every piece of film that we could, and to tell the story accurately. Now, obviously, this is going to be a room for debate, and that's okay. But we have really worked very hard, Peter and I, to present the audience an alternative view of American history that really questions the conventional history that my, I, I was taught in school and that my children are being taught still to this day. Why did you use, why do you use so many uh, 
feature films selections in the... I was set out to reach a younger generation. I find most documentaries, most documentaries tend to be boring and they don't have as wide a viewership. Often the one-to-one -one technique, the talking heads technique, slows down the documentary and makes the point over and over again of one side versus the other side. I had a story to tell of 100 years with a, in 10 chapters, almost, let's say, an estimated decade per 58 minutes. That's, it's a tight squeeze. We had to drop a lot of things, but we wanted to concentrate on the big picture, make it exciting, give it to you as quickly as possible. You can always look at it again if you, if you miss something. I think a lot of people will miss something, no question about it. That's why I think it stands up to our second and third showing. But the use of uh, movie clips makes this thing, it, it becomes less tedious in the course of an hour. And sometimes the movie is very apropos, most of the time. That's the reason we're using it. It's either going against the narrative or with the narrative. Sometimes we use it, for example, with uh, Gregory Peck and Aces High to make the point of what Curtis LeMay is, is, is means by terror bombing. You know, there's always a, is it, the beauty of the series, I find, is that there's more than one thing going on at the time. It's not all, this is the level at which you're watching it. Not like a book. It operates, film operates to the subconscious. So we're back to the subconscious. Yeah, but I'm not, you make me sound like some advertising huckster. I'm not. I'm t deeply dedicated, as you might know from my other work, uh, making speeches and writing and appearing where I do, that I, f I strongly believe in this history of the United States. Now, let's, let's pick that up because I started By the way, I'm not working for a, a cigarette company or a tobacco company. I didn't make any money really on this, uh, on, this, on this project. This has been for love. I remember asking you in our previous connection in Hollywood about a film you had made. What was the name of the film about the uh, GI who comes back? <clears throat> Born on the 4th of July? July. Yeah. Uh, Born just, on the 4th of July. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film. And uh, when one of your violent films, which you and I always fought about. Uh, natural Born Killers. Natural Born Killers, of course. Yeah, uh, you were ahead of the censor board. <laughs> I, I was ahead of the rating board uh, of Mr. Stone. Uh, I, I was so appalled by that, and I remember asking you, why don't you make all your films like the 4th of July? Why this uh, provocative, violent stuff? And you gave me a very interesting and, I guess, honest answer. You said, studios won't. I have other films like that, or I have other films uh, like uh, uh, um, that are too gentle, that may be too gentle. Studios won't be buying Oliver Stone. Uh, so I appreciate that, and I appreciate the work that you put uh, into this. Question I want to ask now. We focused on the dropping of the bomb, focused on the decision that Harry Truman made, focused on the decision that, as you say, the Democrats made in axing Henry Wallace. I don't agree with you. Um, I don't agree that Henry Wallace was what you think uh, he was, a fine, gentle, lovely man. Uh, who I don't think would have stood up as you think he would have. But I want to know whether you think all of our history, from the word go, is a story as, I could use the word venal, but I won't, as self-seeking, as selfish, as money-grubbing, as power-grubbing, as you make the years since the dropping of the bomb. You feel we were always that that's our history. The untold history of America is the counterpart of these years. You've asked a very central question, and we wrestled with it. And uh, I could offer it. With, our history starts in 1900 with the beginning of the expansion of the empire abroad with the Spanish-American War and goes into the reasons of World War I and World War II. And, uh, you know, Peter likes to frame it as a, says that our conventional history is a triumphalist narrative pro-American. America as the winner, as the good guy. America comes out ahead. And I think that's one of the reasons in history why American students don't, are not particularly interested in American history in high school because it's sort of been a dis it's made like a Walt Disney film where we take out all the horror parts. Whereas the students want to see history juicy. They want to see a real, they want to see grim side of history. 
and more like a Saw movie or like a, they want to see what happened. And what we're giving them here is pretty horrifying, some of the stuff we're talking about, pretty horrifying, starting with the atomic bomb. But uh, it's important to realize that we don't all, history is not written by us, that history is written by divine forces or other forces. On, and it has a certain end, end run. And what we see, if we look at other empires in history, is that no empire lasts. Tell me more about these divine forces. What are the teleological ends of history? That's, it's an argument that we can have. Is it, where are we going? Where is our empire going? We are now in control of the world. We have full spectrum dominance of air, land, sea, space, cyberspace. We are the sole superpower. We are military. We do not want to share this. We want to dominate. Now, did we begin this with the beginning of uh, imperialism in the Philippines? Oh, our record in the Philippines is disastrous. Uh, Peter goes into some length about it. But it goes back to, you're, you're asking That's a more I'm profound asking. question, yes. though, because you want to trace it back to the founding of the country. I want to know whether and, you do. Uh, but I, I think it's more complicated. I think you, what you were suggesting was too simple. It's not as if the United States is an evil force from the beginning. He said it's venal, not, a, not evil, he said venal. Uh, yeah. but, but, or, or even now. The United States is like other countries is the point we're trying to make. What we're trying to challenge is the notion of American exceptionalism. What students learn, what people grow up with in this country is the idea that the United States is God's gift to humanity. The United States is different from all other countries. This notion of American exceptionalism, that other countries are motivated by power, by greed, by resources, by territory. Which you agree with. And Yes, and I think the United States is, is too. too. And the United States, we, we painted, as Woodrow Wilson says, now America will see, now the world will see that America is the savior of the world. We have the same statements in, in similar forms by Madeleine Albright, by Hillary Clinton, by Barack Obama, and the, the Republican Party, and many Democrats also. This is the, the, it's in the air that people breathe growing up and living in the United States, that the United States is benign, benevolent, that we're altruistic, that we're generous, that we only want to spread freedom and democracy, that we have the interests of the world at heart. This is the same country that has how many wars have we fought? How many countries have we invaded? How many governments have we overthrown? I mean, this is the, so there, there are two sides. There is a good side to the United States. And the American people want to do good in the world. Of course they do. As, but as do the Afghan, Afghan people, as do the Iraqis. The United States is not different in that way. What makes the United States different is that we have resources, that we have more geologic, geographically isolated, that we've been fortunate to be the victor, that we have a certain kind of abundance, and that we have played a different kind of role. But, but so the Americans, you know, sort of like the idea of George Bush growing up uh, on third base and thinking he hit a triple. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, the United States, Americans are very, very lucky. The American people are lucky to have all, had all these benefits and advantages. But the role the United States played in the world is much more complicated. It's why Americans can't understand why people around the world don't like us. Why, when uh, in the last year of the Bush administration, 19% of Pakistanis had a favorable view of the United States. Now, 12% of Pakistanis have a favorable view. Why do Pakistanis hate us? Why did they hate Bush more than they hated Osama bin Laden? Why is that view a universal view of the United States, this kind of, of American arrogance? Understood. Understood. Where do you want us to go? Us? You, you us say. Us to go? Yeah, you say what you want to do is understand who you are, who we are yeah, as a that's country. That's where I started, yeah, now, to bear witness to our history. Now Knowing what I do know now after these five years of labor, I feel strongly that we have to move away from the empire. I feel very strongly that somewhat like Ron Paul is saying about foreign policy, I feel strongly that we have to stop the global dominance game. Now, it's harder to do all the things we're doing, but we cannot keep supporting this military budget that we have. Which That's why you changed your mind about Brzezinski, I gather. Because he, he's a heel when he's with Carter, and then he well, understands well, what's a happened little is better. That this country well, that's has correct. Moved. Yeah, and, and but Brzezinski changed his mind. He saw where his policies were leading in, in, the, in with the policies on terror. But he hasn't apologized for his policy no. toward the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, which really created the, this Islamic fundamentalism that we're fighting now around What the he world. says is we don't have the power to do this. And I, I, he also says that, that a war against, he says that terrorism is a tactic 
and a war against a tactic makes no sense at all. And he yeah. thinks we've gone so far overboard in this war against terror. You know, I have the feeling, Oliver, you put your finger right on the important point when you said that you were brought up, you were educated uh, in an inadequate way, a little like yeah. Henry Adams saying in his education Good point. Uh, yes. <laughs> that it was so inadequate at Harvard in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, maybe you would be a little happier if you had absorbed earlier on Beard and Hofstadter and Absolutely. all these others stamp and learn that our historians have not been um, um, all that rosy posy about our, mm -hmm. our past. When with, with Beard, with Charles Beard, when he wrote his An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And he got, he was roundly attacked for that. Well, not only that, somebody asked Nicholas Murray Butler, the president of the university, have you read Professor Beard's last book? And he said, I certainly hope so, uh, <laughs> because we hadn't done that before. Um, I found you devoting your great, great, great dramatic talents to uh, a discovery that I think most of us made a long, long time before. Very few of you. I mean, a, a select group of educated historians, but most people don't know this. And yes. You know, and most presidents don't know this. Obviously, Harry Truman didn't care much for history. He didn't seem to have a sense of what the Russians had been through. And our presidents have ignored this. So you talk about an elite. Uh, I'm talking about a mass, and that's why I make films. Yeah. I'm trying to get it out to a mass. This is a, how do I undo what we've done? How do we undo it? But you look at Oliver's Vietnam films, how yeah. passionately anti-war they are, and this latest survey of 18 to 29-year-olds found 51% of American 18 to 29-year-olds think that the Vietnam War was worth fighting. 51%, which is just appalling at this point. You know, I can't help but wish that I had given a course on Oliver Stone's films <laughs> and that you had come into my course and that I had convinced you to be somewhat more moderate and to devote those great dramatic talents to a less one-sided picture. That this is I not think a one-sided. Wait, I take objection to that. I object. Because I mean, if we, we have a very po we, we have a very positive view of certain American presidents and, and American policies. We have a very God, positive it would view be of, hard of, of to Roosevelt. Note that. We, no, it wouldn't we? Beyond very, Roosevelt, Kennedy. We say that Kennedy underwent a fundamental change after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that the Kennedy who was assassinated was not the same Kennedy who got elected. That Kennedy who gave the American University commencement speech in June of 1963, mm -hmm. one of the great speeches of the 20th century, basically calling for peace and calling for ending the Cold War. And he wanted to end the arms race. He wanted to end nuclear testing. And he wanted to uh, pull the US troops out of Vietnam. We've got a very positive view of him. We have a positive view of early Carter. Yeah. We have a positive view of early Obama. You know, we had a lot of hope, faith and hope in Obama. We were very disappointed that Obama too, turned out. At the beginning, Clinton. What hope do you have now? As I said at the chapter 10, I said, history has shown us that the curve of the ball can break differently. Yeah. We've seen repeatedly in our history, from Wallace, Stalin's death, Eisenhower's reception to his death, what happened at that point, the fig leaf offered by the Soviet leaders. We saw it in uh, Carter's presidency. We saw it in Kennedy's moment of, in 62, 63. We see it when, uh, when Bush, uh, when uh, Reagan meets with Gorbachev. That was an amazing moment. Possibly the, could have, the whole nuclear arms race could have been terminated in, the, in that moment. Was Gorbachev your uh, Russian Henry Wallace? Yes, yes, I'd say so. I think he was an amazing man. So was, and by the way, we credit Nikita Khrushchev for having had the guts, like with Kennedy, to pull back. And both hardliners on both sides were pushing them for nuclear war to, in Cuba. Khrushchev paid the price. He, yeah. was, he was removed from office. Kennedy was removed from office. It's an interesting parallel there. We also, we, we got, Obama gave us great hopes, great hopes in 2008. We thought it would be different. What impact? And by the way, 2000 election is fascinating to me because I was, I really think there would be a huge difference between Al Gore and George Bush. So the curve of the ball, it'll come again. 
it'll come again. And there'll be younger people out there who maybe would have known some of this history who might be able to take advantage of that curve and hit it out of the park. So that's your hope, and that's why well, education you've done is my hope. The yes, education and bearing witness to the past. When when Mr. Obama said we must not look to the past, we must look to the future, I abhorred that statement because it was an ignorant statement, and it's exactly what we're not doing. Tell me why. Tell me why it is an ignorant statement. Do you know what he meant? He wasn't asking us to derive. He said, let us put the horrors behind us, which is of the war on terror, the, what Bush had done. And instead, he, all he did is transparent. Un, in softer language, he continued that policies and expanded yes. them. Reagan said the same thing about Vietnam. Let us forget about Vietnam. It was uh, the Vietnam syndrome is behind us, et cetera, because the war was not disgraceful. And he, gave, and he, he rewrote history. And Bush, the father, did the same thing about Vietnam when he said, after we went into Kuwait, that the sands of the, uh, the Vietnam syndrome is buried under the sands of Arabia. These are, this is disastrous history, by the way. We're repeating the people who don't even know about the Vietnam War are fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, young soldiers. They don't care. Peter, let me ask you to forgive me yes. if I ask our friend Oliver what he's going to do now. About history? Well, I'm going to let you answer the question. I don't know, Richard. I'm, I killed myself on this. Uh, I mean, with, metaphorically, I feel really, uh, I reached a place where I'm proud of what, what I did. I think I achieved everything I wanted to do in film. If I make it on the film, it'd be because I really wanted to. I really wanted to. I just know after you do something like this, it's very hard to go back to sometimes a smaller subject matter to film. And it's quite conceivable that shortly I will do something. You know, I don't want to give up film. I like it. It's a, it's a good way to, to uh, I'd like to tell stories. I like to dramatize. Um, and I'll probably find the right subject. I thought in, in, um, in watching your 10 films, I thought that the many times you drew upon um, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Mr. Deans goes to town, whatever, whatever you did, that you were surely going to pick up and do more like that, that you wished very much that oh, yeah. you had been around at yeah. that time and had done those. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think those were great. The 1930s was one of the best times for Hollywood in terms of liberal screenwriters. Many of them got branded in the blacklist and the gray list. They were, uh, the man who wrote Mr. Smith Goes to Washington was a, Sidney Buckman was a communist. You know, the, some of the best writers were communists. Unfortunately, they were run out of time. There hasn't been much, many liberal films in the U.S. Uh, since the war. There was about 30 or 40 anti-communist films that were virulent uh, made in the 40s, late 40s and early 50s. And that attitude continued through, uh, even Patton, films like this, they're very pro-American, pro-war. Most of the political films are that way. Even the All the President's Men, it's lauded by our press, but it's basically lauding ourselves for for running uh, Nixon uh, out of office, you know. And, but as a result of that film, we, we finally felt self-satisfied and the press went to sleep. And after that, the press goes more and more conservative. Now we have a press that isn't really doing its job. In the president since Kennedy, including Kennedy, where do you want to print your medals? I'm sorry? Among the presidents, yeah. including Kennedy right. since that time, where do you want to put the medals that say, well done, job well done. Well, I think Roosevelt and Kennedy certainly deserve it. Unfortunately, I don't think Obama does yet. Uh, yet? Why yet? One hopes he has two, three years left, three years left. I, you wish him well. I mean, he's not a man to dislike. It's just Peter. he hasn't turned it around. What do you think? Or are they <clears throat> all? Hmm? Or are they all to be? They're all to be criticized. Uh, in the same it's sense the that, that Obama, yeah, I mean, uh, Obama has some wonderful notions. He called for nuclear abolition in his Prague speech. We applauded him for that. Uh, but he doesn't critique the empire. Obama, well, he has the, little sense of that. We still have 700 to 1,000 bases around the world. But, but uh, Oliver says to you, it's the system. Uh, are you suggesting you can't get out of the system. That's what I'm suggesting. I am. And I'm suggesting we can. 
And, and one of the things we try to show throughout this, we try to give a sense of hope. We try to show how close history has come time after time to being fundamentally different. Fundamentally different. That's how we could have taken different roads and that there was an opportunity to take different roads and people in power and uh, made bad decisions and the public wasn't mobilized enough to force them to behave differently. That's why we're trying to reach the people. We believe we have a certain faith in people. We think that if people learn a different kind of history, then they will act upon that understanding. We work on the assumption that people's actions are based upon a, a view of history, as Charles Beard and Carl Becker and un others understood, that every person is his, his or her own historian. Every person has a certain view of history. And if people think that hist the way things turned out is the only way it could have been, then they can't imagine That's a different true. future. Yeah. And we want people to be able to dream. We want them to imagine. We want them to understand that the world could be fundamentally different and it could be fundamentally better. And that's what we think well, is so missing now. Hegel would be uh, also, uh, he's not a historian, Hegel the philosopher, might well come in useful at this point to remember the synthesis, antithesis, thesis idea of history, that one thing sets up its opposite. Here we are, we're st I said the system is suffocating us. Uh, the president is surrounded by a bureaucracy that's heavily entrenched. He has a media that basically is conservative and moves against him whenever he tries to change too much. He, he's got Wall Street, which sells bonds, which sells the idea of American supremacy. And he's got the hugest second country in the world is the Pentagon, which is enormous. Uh, the budget is almost the size of most other countries combined. How do, you, how do you get, you're stuck in this box. What happens? This is where Hegel comes in. Because we may reach a, sufficient, a sufficiency, sufficiency of force, of being who we are, that we get sick of ourselves. We spend too much. We eat too much. We get so arrogant that we, miss, we misunderstand the Iraq or the Afghani situations. We stumble. And the fourth-rate power, like in Vietnam, defeats us. And These things happen in history, and they have happened. The Roman Empire was stuffed when it fell. When it fell. We're falling now. I've gotten the signal to say goodbye. Oh, okay. We're falling. Peter and Oliver, thank you both for joining me again thank you, Richard. today. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.